up where I left off yesterday. Yesterday I talked about um, Africans um, swimming and diving and alluded to slaves being brought to the New World um, and how they brought these uh, swimming and diving skills with them. Um, so if you weren't here yesterday, um, I don't know, you might be missing a little bit, but um, oh well. So anyway, let me, let me go ahead and, and, uh, and start. Um, at a time when most Europeans were not uh, able to swim well enough to save their own lives, African swimming traditions were conveyed across the Atlantic in the bellies of 40,000 slave ships that brought some 12 million Africans to the New World. These enslaved people used familiar African swim strokes, including the crawl to recreate recreational and theatrical swimming activities based on skills that had discrete African meanings. This talk documents how slaves transported swimming and underwater diving skills to the Americas. It seeks to enhance our understanding of slavery by exploring how this system of labor was shaped by cultural retentions scholars have ignored. First, it examines um, how slaves incorporated swimming into their recreational practices. Uh, then, since slavery was work, um, this talk explores how slave owners used bond people's swimming and diving skills in several lucrative capacities. Because occupational diving was dangerous and required exceptional skill, it sometimes influenced white slave, uh, white slave relationships, prompting whites to reward slaves' dexter dexterities by granting them privileges. Finally, it considers myths pertaining to the notion that black people, specifically African Americans as opposed to Afro-Brazilians or Afro-Caribbeans, uh, can't swim. Um, slaves swam for recreation and enjoyment, and like their African antecedents, female slaves were generally strong swimmers and divers. In the evening, many slaves slipped into the water to cool off, relax, and wash away the day's trouble. North Carolina slave Bill Crump recalled, quote, we worked in the fields from sunup to sundown, but we had a couple of hours at dinner time to swim or lay on the banks of the creek and sleep, end quote. When John Stedman was, was in Guyana during the 1770s, he repeatedly observed how slaves um, swam, noting swimming is their favorite diversion, which they practice every day. On one occasion, he asked an older slave um, Af apparently African-born slave named Karamaka, how he maintained his health in such a, in uh, this tropical disease-prone environment, um, which contributed to many premature deaths. Karamaka said, quote, swim every day, twice or thrice, sir, in the river. This not only serves for exercise, but also keeps the skin clean and cool, and the pores open, so I enjoy free perspir perspiration. Without this, by imperceptible filth, the pores are shut and the juices stagnate and disease must invariably follow, end quote. Enslaved canoemen throughout the Americas were often compelled to paddle for upwards of 12 hours per day. They swam during respites to cool off and to soothe aching muscles. For example, while George Pincard was in Guyana in the early 19th century, canoemen paddled him and a group of white travelers up the Berbice River from, quote, half past eight in the morning until seven in the evening, end quote. Whenever the bondmen became, quote, extremely heated and bathed in perspiration, they were permitted to rest occasionally for a few minutes. During these intervals, they plunged from the side of the boat into the river and swam about in order to cool themselves off and drive away fatigue, end quote. Importantly, these instances of slave swimming, of, ens of enslaved canoemen swimming provided white spectators in the Americas with distinctively African scenes that were not replicated by white mariners who were largely incapable of swimming. <coughs> Slave swimming habits extended beyond impromptu activities. Bond people competed in sports activities including boxing, wrestling matches, and foot and horse races. Such activities could enhance slaves' self-esteem, make enslavement more bearable, and uh, many slaveholders believe sports allowed bond people to vent their frustrations without threatening the stability of slavery. Though such activities typically occurred away from white supervision, some slaveholders organized slaves' recreational activities. In the 1770s, John Stedman noted that adolescent slaves in Guyana competed in 
informal swim contest, saying they, quote, swam in groups of boys and girls, and both sexes exhibit astonishing feats of courage, strength, and activity. I have seen a slave girl beat a hardy youth in swimming across the river, end quote. Slaves also swam in formal planter-organized contest. Slaveholders occasionally organized boxing matches that pitted the champion fighter of one plantation against that of another. They also similarly organized swimming contest. In the 17th century, Richard Ligon observed a planter-organized contest in which slaves from Barbados had to catch a duck placed in a large pond. The captor was awarded the duck. The proprietor of this contest, Colonel Drakes, quote, called for some of his best swimming Negroes and commanded them to swim and take this duck, but forbade them to, to dive, for if they were not barred that play, they would rise up under the duck and take her as she swung, and so the sport would have been ended too quickly, end quote. Describing the slave's use of the breaststroke and crawl, Ligon said, said, quote, in this chase, there was much of pleasure to see the various swimming styles of the slaves. Some the ordinary way, referring to the breaststroke, um, some by striking out their right leg and uh, left arm and then turning on the other side and changing both their legs and arms, which is a stronger and swifter way of swimming than any of the others in the world, end quote. The winner of this contest was a female slave. Whether organized by slaves or slaveholders, swimming contest probably offered the winners prestige in the slave community and indicated that female slaves could beat their male counterparts. In addition to providing enslaved participants and observers with entertainment, the communal nature of such activities probably enhanced slaves' sense of community. Like their African ancestors, slaves born in the Americas learned to swim at an early age. And several accounts indicate or detail the swimming activities of enslaved children um, who were between the ages of seven and 12 years. These children were very comfortable in the water, indicating that they learned to swim at, when considerably younger. One of the first sights that greeted John Stedman's eyes when he entered the Suriname River after crossing the Atlantic was quote, was, quote, groups of naked boys and girls promiscuously playing and flouncing like tritons and mermaids in the water, end quote. Frederick Douglass recalled that near his home where he lived when he was approximately seven or eight years old, quote, there was a creek to swim in, at the bottom of which, um, at the bottom of an open flat space of 20 acres or more called Long Green. It was a very beautiful playground for the boys and girls, end quote. Enslaved parents, family members, and entire slave communities probably taught children to swim, just as they instructed them in gardening, cooking, sewing, hunting, and enduring the hardships of bondage. Though it is impossible to determine the percentage of slaves that could swim proficiently, sources suggest that most did. Discussing the abilities of slaves in Barbados, Richard Ligon stated, quote, they are excellent swimmers and divers, both men and women, end quote. Robert Walsh, uh, when Robert Walsh traversed uh, Brazil in the 1820s, he concluded that most slaves could swim, dubbing them, quote unquote, amphibious. Francis Frederick, um, who was enslaved in Virginia and Kentucky during the mid-1800s, contended that most bond people could swim, saying, quote, unlike most slaves, I never learned to swim. Swimming helped some bond people maintain their familial bonds, uh, the familial bonds that slavery often sought to destroy. With or without their owner's approval, some husbands and wives that lived in different plantations swam across uh, bodies of water to reach slave holdings where their spouses and other family members and friends resided. For example, a slave named Richard in Louisiana often swam two miles across the bayou, two miles each way across the bayou, to visit his wife, uh, Betty. Some have incorrectly speculated that slaveholders tried to discourage slaves from swimming because it did not increase bond people's value and could aid them in escaping. Indeed, many slaves did incorporate swimming into their repertoires of resistance. In the American South, some slaves swam across the Ohio and Potomac River, rivers which separate the North from the South um, during their journeys to Northern freedom. Caribbean slaves, singly and in family units, swam from one island to another in their attempts to secure freedom, requiring them to swim across waterways that were at least a mile wide. 
Uh, when slaves wanted to discuss clandestine topics, they would often, that would result in severe punishment if overheard by eavesdropping overseers and slaveholders, they often took to the water in African style dugout canoes or by swimming. Um, there they could freely converse, knowing that even the stealthiest white authority figure um, could not sneak up on them. And this image, um, it somewhat depicts how slaves would, would go into the water. It, it, if you actually read the account, it talks about them swimming, although here it shows them uh, and wading into the water um, during secret meetings. Um, while slaveholders um, did not want slaves to integrate swimming into their arsenals of resistance, they generally lacked the time and desire to prevent bond people from swimming. Additionally, Swimming could considerably increase slaves' usefulness and monetary value, and many slaveholders recognized that slaves' ability to swim could prevent the drowning death of valuable pieces of property. Hence, many slaveholders encouraged, or at least did not um, inhibit this activity. And one of the things that I found is that if you look at the 1880 or the 1850s, um, the average uh, field slave, if you adjust for inflation, would have cost between twenty and thirty thousand dollars in today's currency. Um, whereas underwater divers, if you adjust for for inflation, could cost upwards of a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So, by instructing slaves to swim, the slave owners considerably increased uh, potentially their profit margins, um, quadrupling them in, in, in several instances. Um, recognizing the superior capabilities of many people of African descent, some whites advocated their use as lifeguards and swimming instructors for white people. When John Clinkscales of South Carolina was a boy, one of his father's slaves named Essex taught him to swim. Afterwards, Essex served as Clinkscales' lifeguard, um, so as he swam in, the, in rivers and streams, um, Clinkscales would, would watch after him. Indeed, throughout the Atlantic world, slaves' swimming proficiencies and whites' inabilities were juxtaposed when maritime accidents compelled black people to save the lives of drowning whites. In 1805, Barbadian slaveholder Robert Haynes sent his three sons to school in Liverpool, um, along with his slave named Hamlet, who, quote, saved the life of my son George when he fell overboard whilst landing at Liverpool, end quote. Similarly, a white clerk who, quote, could only swim a few strokes, slipped off a ship's gangway in, ba in the Baltimore Harbor and was pulled by the current far out into the harbor, end quote. Fortunately for him, his enslaved friend Zamba, who was, quote, raised on the south banks of the Congo River, where he'd become a, uh, quite used to the water and could swim like a seagull, dove in after him, and after a few minutes' strenuous e exertion, made up to his friend, who was just in the moment at that moment, sinking, having seized him by the collar with his left hand, um, he continued to keep him afloat until a boat came alongside and hauled them in." End quote. Uh, similarly, after a Brazilian steamer ran aground and began to break apart during a storm, an African-born sailor named Samoa, quote, swam through the furious breakers, end quote, 13 times to save as many passengers. Uh, he was rewarded with about a fix sixteen thousand uh, dollars in cash, um, and a statue was erected in his likeness. Even the white people were amazed by the swimming and underwater diving abilities of Africans and in, of, uh, of Africans and enslaved women and men. Uh, many were not used, or I should say, excuse me, let me start over. Even the white people were amazed by the swimming and underwater diving abilities of African and slave women, uh, slave women were not used as divers, perhaps because of the tradition that barred women from maritime uh, trades. Enslaved male divers, however, were highly skilled and their diving abilities were unrivaled. Many could dive 90 plus feet. It is unclear how divers acquired their abilities, but the lung capacity and composure required to work at such depth suggest they learned to swim at early ages. <clears throat> As with masons, seamstresses, and blacksmiths, divers enjoyed the privileges slaveholders bestowed on skilled slaves. Slaves generally detested agricultural labor, and, most important, and the most important privilege a, a slave could receive was placement in a skilled occupation. Such jobs enabled them to escape the monotony 
field work, find dignity in their labor, enhance their self-esteem, gain the respect of their fellow slaves, and sometimes obtain cash payments, which benefited their lives and those of their family members. Skilled slaves were often trusted by their owners, who frequently allowed them to work free of direct white supervision. Divers differed from um, other skilled bond people in a significant way. Most skilled slaves ascended to, pri to privilege by gaining competency in Western artisanry. However, divers' abilities were African-derived. Thus, they demonstrated the vitality of African cultural transmissions and, how, and their power to shape the new world. Importantly, the privileges that skilled slaves received were not the fruits of benevolence. Rather, slaveholders bestowed favors to extract more labor and in turn wealth from skilled slaves' limbs and minds. While diving was an arduous, dangerous occupation that taxed divers' health and claimed many lives, enslaved divers gained material rewards and respite from field labor, permitting them to live existences of privileged exploitation. Um, Spanish colonists along Venezuela's Pearl Coast, um, the, this northern coast of, of South America, um, and the Margarita Island, um, if you, you can see the star, um, were the first Westerners to exploit enslaved African swimmers. Initially, Amerindians were forced to dive for pearls. As disease and overwork depleted their numbers, Spanish colonists looked to Africa for laborers. Commenting on this practice, Pieta de Mare said that Gold Coast Africans, quote, are very fast swimmers and can keep themselves underwater for a long time. They can dive amazingly far and can see underwater. Uh, because they are so good at swimming and diving, they are especially kept for that purpose in many countries and employed in this capacity uh, where there is a need for them, such as Margarita Island in the West Indies, where pearls are found and brought up from the bottom by divers, end quote. In the morning, uh, Pearl canoes set out for these pearl fisheries, which generally lay in waters over 80 feet deep. Um, and here's an image from, uh, by Francis Drake that was, that was uh, created in the 15, if I remember correctly, the 1590s, um, showing pearl divers. Um, describing the diving process on Margarita Island, Antonio Espinosa said, quote, when they dive underwater, they carry little nets fastened by a rope to a canoe above, end quote. As they ripped pearl oysters from the rocky fastness, they deposited them into these nets, end quote. With great speed and skill, they come uh, with this to the surface, end quote. While catching their breath between dives, they frequently received a glass of wine and a pipe of tobacco as refreshment. Ironically, though, both would have uh, significantly impaired their diving abilities. While visiting Margarita Island in the late 16th century, after overfishing precipitated um, its pearl fisheries decline, Richard Hawkins became impressed by the ability of, these I of the island's, quote, expert swimmers and divers, saying, with um, track of time, use of continual practice, um, many have learned to hold their breath for a long time underwater for the better achievement of their work, uh, end quote. Can you advance? This next image, um, the bottom uh, part, shows pearl divers in uh, the Persian Gulf. Um, and the reason why I included this is because there are no images of divers um, in the New World, no underwater image of divers in the New World. But you can see this image, which was done in 1884, um, kind of showing the, their work underwater. Um, these pearl divers were entitled to a portion of the harvest, um, the pearls they harvest. Uh, which they were forced to sell to their owners. Describing these regulated commercial transactions, De Espinosa said, quote, to this end, on certain holidays, they lay on the table or elsewhere excellent suits of clothes or other valuable articles of clothing, and the slaves come out uh, with the clothes and their masters the riches, end quote. S um, still, some divers accumulated enough wealth to purchase their freedom. Pearl diving was strenuous, life-threatening work. An oceanic trench near the Pearl Coast channels uh, cold water into the otherwise warm uh, Caribbean waters, causing the year-round surface temperature to, rubber, to hover in the 60s, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, as they descended, though, the water temperatures dropped considerably. 
These cold waters induced exposure-related illnesses and sometimes culminated in death. Pearl divers' eardrums sometimes burst, so, quote, the blood gushes out of their mouths and noses when they come above the water, end quote. While this was not fatal, it could cause them to lose their equilibrium and drown. Shark attacks, sharks attacked divers, some drowned, while pirates kidnapped, injured, and killed others. Prior to the 1545 discovery of silver deposits in Peru, divers probably generated more wealth um, than any than was produced anywhere else um, in the Americas. Um, and this next image is kind of a stylized rendition of the, the pearl fisheries. And you can see right here this massive pile of pearls, which undoubtedly they did not pile the pearls up like this, but it, again, it, it reflects the wealth um, that these divers um, were generating. <coughs> Excuse me. Rather, their valuable services encouraged their use in other maritime occupations. When Spanish treasure galleons sank, enslaved divers were employed as salvage workers. The Spanish began using African salvage divers after a 28 fleet or 28 ship treasure fleet sailed into a hurricane in 1622. Aware that enslaved pearl divers dove to great depths, Gaspar de Vargas, who was in charge of the salvage operation, took 20 pearl divers to the wreck area. Freedom was promised to the first slave who found a sunken galleon. One day, an excited diver surfaced, shouting that he had located the treasure ship Santa Margarita, named after the island Santa Margarita or Margarita Island. Uh, and as promised, he was granted his freedom. This Spanish success set the precedent for employing enslaved salvage divers. When slaveholders in the Bahamas, Bermuda, Cayman Islands, and Florida began wrecking or salvaging goods from grounded and sunken ships around the Florida Straits during the 18th century, they typically employed at least one slave who could dive to depths of at least 70 feet. In the antebellum American South, some bond people uh, bond people's swimming abilities were used to clear fisheries of debris that could um, ensnare fishing nets. Divers toiled on two types of fisheries or fishing grounds. Some worked for their owners on waterways near their owners' plantations. Others were hired to commercial fisheries located in coastal estuaries. Charles Ball, um, who by his own account was an expert swimmer, explained that during the winter, um, his owner employed him and two other slaves um, to clear, fish, to clear uh, logs and debris from a fishery um, on South Carolina's Congaree River. Um, though the work was hard and uh, cold, Vall described that he welcomed uh, the opportunity to escape field labor. In the mid-1850s, Frederick Law Olmsted penned a detailed description of North Carolina's intercoastal fishery. Um, Actually, I don't have, well, I have an image of the, the, the fishing grounds. Um, and here you can actually see the way that they were catching fish. And what they were using is, is what are called nets that were called seines or scenes, where you have um, the rectangular nets. They're weighted on one side, uh, one of the longer rectangular, or one, one of the, 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 the longer sides of the rectangular is weighted. The other side has buoys, so it floats uh, vertically in the water. And it's brought straight out into the water, and then kind of a half circle or arching motion brought back to shore. And so these nets would drag the bottom and catch all the fish that were between you know, the net and shore. And so it was important that you not have debris on the bottom um, that would catch and potentially uh, destroy or damage these nets. And so, um, again, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted described this, uh, these fisheries in the 1850s um, and how slaves um, slave divers removed debris from the, the uh, North Carolina Sound. Um, work upon these fisheries entailed long, dangerous hours. The most hazardous aspect of clearing fishery grounds required the use of 70 pounds of gunpowder, or 70 kegs of gunpowder, excuse me. In many places, coastal subsided submerged swamps, quote, leaving stump, the stumps of great cypress trees not in the least decayed, yet protruding from the bottom of these sounds, end quote. Enslaved divers were key to their removal. After divers had ascertained uh, the position of debris, two large boats were moored overhead. Divers then fastened chains to the stumps or logs, which, they, which was used to hoist uh, them to the surface. 
um, using windlasses. When stumps would not yield and the power of the windlass pulled the boat's sides to the water's edge, a more dramatic technique was employed. With the stump still chained to the boat, a diver placed a long iron tip spike on the stump, which sledgehammer wielding slaves in the boats above drove into it. Once an approximately 10 foot cavity was made in the stump, the pole was removed. A diver then inserted a cylindrical canister containing several pounds of explosives into the void. The charge was detonated while the stump was still, still chained to the boats, and the ro resultant explosion, combined with the upward force of the chains, wrenched the stump free. Um, Olmsted described how divers, um, how these divers were highly valued for both their skills and for the revenues they generated, writing, quote, the success of the operation evidently depends mainly on the discretion and skill of the diver. Some of them could remain underwater and work there to better advantage than others, but all were admirably skillful, end quote. The fishing operator uh, told Olmsted that the previous summer his divers had removed over 1,000 stumps in this method. Fishery divers largely worked free of direct white supervision. When not diving, quote, and while the other hands were working, they may lounge about or go to sleep in the boats, end quote. Unlike most slaves who were not permitted to freely consume alcohol, quote, divers, when a diver displays unusual hardy, uh, hardihood, skill, or perseverance, he was rewarded with whiskey or money, end quote. Consequently, er, uh, these divers earn substantial monetary bonuses, which sometimes enable them to purchase their freedom. Though privileged, these divers were not lazy. Pride uh, in their workmanship um, and material rewards drove them to excel. He concluded, Olmsted concluded, that these bondmen worked arduously and perilously in a profession proclaiming, quote, what slaves eager to work and working cheerfully, earnestly, and skillfully, being for the time managed as free men, their ambitions Simon, uh, stimulated by wages, suddenly they too reveal sterling manhood and honor their creator." End quote. A close look at enslaved divers expands our understanding of the lives of skilled bond people. All of these divers enjoyed genuine privileges. Some were granted their freedom, and many accumulated enough material wealth to purchase their liberty. Fishing divers, fishery divers, seem to have been highly trusted. They apparently worked away from direct white supervision, and while slaveholders typically refused to permit, to permit slaves to carry weapons, these divers were trained in the use of explosives. While most skilled slaves' positions of privileged exploitation depended upon abilities in Western artisanry, divers' dexterities were African-based, um, divers probably took great pride in their abilities they knew they could descend to depths few other people could, and that they had proficiencies that their owners did not possess. They braved cold waters, the dangers of underwater pressure, and sharks. Uh, their diving abilities not only made them exceptional among, exceptional, exceptional among slaves, but an exception within the human race. This study demonstrates that bond people's swimming activities touch their lives in everyday uh, touch their everyday lives in important ways. In an age when few Westerners could swim, many slaves mastered this skill. Recreational swimming allowed field slaves to relax and cleanse themselves. When bond people competed in swimming contests, they exhibited their skills and won material re rewards, enhancing their prestige and self-esteem and increasing the slave community's sense of cohesion. Though the work was grueling, enslaved underwater divers welcomed the escape from monotonous, backbreaking agricultural labor. But slavery, no matter the occupation, was always hard work, and the privileges divers enjoyed were restricted by the fetters of bondage. Being a slave, even an enslaved diver, meant subjugation, harsh treatment, and never-ending toil. Still, enslaved swimmers and divers use skills of African origin to make slavery a little more bearable and sometimes obtain existences of privileged exploitation. Uh, a historical understanding of the swimming abilities of people of African descent 
um, and the inabilities of people of European descent raises several pro provocative issues concerning today's American society, um, providing fodder for, uh, fodder for further analysis. Since, as sources suggest, many early black people were joint swimmers, well, um, why are many African Americans, um, excuse me, since, as sources suggest, many early black people were adroit swimmers, why then are African Americans at least 50% more likely to drown than white Americans, and why are there so few dominant African American competitive swimmers? Myths purportedly answer these questions, and there are kind of two general myths, if you will, uh, the first is that the Atlantic slave trade was so brutal um, that it caused slaves to become terrified of the water. Um, and the other is that slaveholders actually tried to prevent slaves um, from swimming. Now some have postulated, um, again, that, that uh, the horrors of the Atlantic slave trade caused African Americans to, uh, to become fearful of water. Yet there is no evidence that slaves had any historical memory of this ordeal, and the historical memory of the slave trade that exists in the African American community was developed not during slavery, but in the 1960s, as, African, as the African American community was, for the first time, able to learn about its past. Others have postulated that slaveholders' use of dunking or simulated drownings um, as a means of punishing or discouraging slaves um, uh, from swimming caused black people to, to, to stop swimming. However, there is no evidence that these practices were widely used punishments. And if it discouraged American slaves from swimming, then why do large numbers of Afro-Caribbean and Afro-Brazilian peoples um, swim? Um, and, and importantly, uh, even though the systems of uh, the bond, uh, importantly, even though the systems of bondage that existed in the Caribbean and in Brazil were far more uh, brutal and sadistic than the types of slavery that existed in America, again, black people in, in those two regions swim, while you have these ideas that swimming is, is unblack or white activity in the African American community. Um, if slavery and the Atlantic slave trade convinced American slaves not to swim, then it should have also deterred Caribbean and Brazilian slaves to abandon um, their African heritage um, as well, which it didn't. Historical phenomenon uh, the historical phenomena that began to occur in the 1890s, some 30 years after the abolition of slavery, um, probably precipitated the decline of swimming in the African American community. Segregation and cities' unwillingness to duplicate expensive recreational facilities for blacks deprived black neighborhoods of swimming pools. Denied access to pools, African Americans also chose not to swim in natural water in the natural waterways they had once used. In many places in the Jim Crow South, as well as the North, racial violence transformed natural, natural waterways from places of leisure to foreboding scenes of subjugation. Rural bodies of water um, were sites of conflict, violence, and subjection, as black beachgoers and swimmers were increasingly attacked and sometimes killed. Rivers and lakes were also the final resting places for countless numbers of murdered uh, black bodies. A, a good example of that is Emma Tills, who was um, lynched in 18, actually beaten to death. He was a 14 year old who was beaten to death, if you're not familiar with the story, in 1855, Mississippi, and his body was then dumped in a waterway. Um, for African American youth barred from municipal swimming pools, rural lakes and streams became a dubious alternative. As African Americans were denied access to desirable swimming amenities, Many apparently began to perceive swimming as a white, or at least an unblack practice, rendering it culturally unpopular. While definitive conclusions about contemporary African American swimming practices must await sustained uh, research and analysis, historical sources unequivocally indicate that until um, fairly recently, people of African descent were usually stronger, more efficient swimmers, uh, and underwater divers than people of European descent. Many Africans, again, incorporated swimming into numerous aspects of their work and recreational lives. Um, Westerners debased the swimming abilities of, of people of African descent, um, referring to my talk yesterday, asserting that the crawl was unsophisticated and uncivilized, um, and that Africans' ability to, to swim 
was actually proof that they were um, uncivilized and bestial. But paradoxically, swi the swimmers of African descent saved the lives of many drowning white people, while slaveholders profitably exploited bond people's underwater diving abilities. Thank you. seem to have been derived from indigenous people. I mean, as, as you may well know, know um, like swim fins were uh, different societies, different peoples throughout the world actually tied palm fronds to their feet and used those as diving, as, as fins. Um, I'm not sure, I forget what those nose clips are called. I'm not sure when they were invented, but they seem to have been in use um, by divers going back to the 15, maybe the 1400s. Um, yeah, I mean, because you know, as you descend, you get oh, all this water pressure going okay. in, and uh, yeah. You cite Frederick Law Olmsted uh, in regard to describing the fisheries in the 1850s. This is the same Olmsted who's responsible for Ohm's Law. Ohm's in electrical engineering. No, no. no. Frederick Law Olmsted was a, um, a landscape architect. He's most famous for designing okay. Central Park, right. um, yeah. but a lot of other public landscapes. Yeah, but he traveled throughout the South um, at this time. He wrote a, a couple books about his, his travels. Did some of the divers gain enough wealth to purchase freedom for spouses or children? That's un, it's unclear. Probably they did because I mean there's not a lot of evidence about these divers as far as what they did after they obtained their freedom, but we know from other slaves that are, that are better well documented who were able to purchase their freedom and they oftentimes purchased that of their their, their family members. So yeah. Kevin, well, you talked about the, um, the the gentleman from the ball plantation in South Carolina. Were you able to get a percentage of how many of their um, bonded people on the coast of South Carolina were actual divers? Um, no, I mean, it's, it's um, the records, there's problems with the records. I mean, one of the problems is they never, they rarely ever, uh, unless it's a slave, they rarely ever, and even, well, even slaves oftentimes didn't name other slaves. Um, the reason being is that these, Slaves were oftentimes doing things they, they shouldn't have been doing. I mean, Charles Ball, he became this fishery diver, and he used it, I mean, kind of an interesting anecdote, he, he used it to, uh, they gained all this autonomy, and so what they did is they started stealing all kinds of stuff from their owner. I mean, they're stealing cotton and, and things and selling it to passing river boats. And so he doesn't really name, he doesn't name other slaves that were doing this, but on his plantation, they had about, I think about 200 slaves. There were at least four of these divers. Um, that were kind of occupational divers, although many of the other slaves would have been able to swim. And so the, the problem with trying to quantify this is that either white accounts didn't name the names or slaves didn't name the names, and so you, it's, you run the risk if you're trying to count people of double counting or triple counting people um, if you're going by different accounts of a, of a, a specific area, so you can't really, um, it's difficult to say on a, you know, a given area uh, other than to say, I mean, all of the divers, the sources indicate that all of the divers in this, this accounting, in uh, the fisheries of, of North Carolina were slaves, or some were free blacks, but most were slaves. Um, none were white, um, and none seemed to have been Native Americans. Any other questions? Yeah, is there anywhere where a student, say a high schooler, could access this information now in a cohesive body of um, yeah, I've actually written a couple articles on it um, that I could I could uh, email I could forward them on to you. Thank you. Yeah. When did 
whites start fulfill, uh, filling the roles that blacks previously played as divers and when did, when did it start to shift and was it official or I mean how did that happen? Yeah, I mean that goes kind of beyond my, my, my time period because I, I, I deal primarily with slavery. Um, but what it seems what seems to have happened is that with the invention of diving gear, um, you have this shift from slaves doing it to white people doing it, namely diving suits. And what's interesting is that um, I mean, so you have slaves and Native Americans diving for conch, for pearls, uh, for sponges, all these kinds of things. And then with the invention of diving suits, white people don't have to swim. They just put on these helmets and boots and drop down and walk around the bottom and collect these things and, and salvage goods from sunken ships. And so it seemed to have been the 1880s, 1890s. You know, I, I haven't found any accounts of, of that at this time, you know, free black people or native peoples diving for goods. I mean, using modern diving equipment. I mean, they're still diving for these, but they begin to be replaced by, um, by white divers using these, this other you know, technology. And it was, it was deemed that, that, that black people didn't have the intellectual ability to use these suits. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you very much.